Welcome to this video. My name is Will Smith and I'm a computer scientist. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to something called artificial intelligence or AI. You may have heard of AI or robotics or chat GPT, self-driving cars and other similar things. I hope that in this video, I can help you understand what AI really is and also a little bit about how it actually works. Let's start by breaking down that name. So first, artificial. This means that we're talking about a machine, like a computer or a robot. We're not talking about any kind of animal or human. Second, intelligence. This means that the machine is doing something that we consider clever. We'll talk a bit more later about what that might actually mean. Computing machines have been around a lot longer than you probably realise. The first attempts to build mechanical computers started almost exactly 200 years ago. This is Charles Babbage's difference engine. It's mainly made of cogs, a bit like what you could build with a Lego set, and it was powered by a steam engine. The very first computer programmer was a woman called Ada Lovelace. She immediately started to realise the amazing things we would one day be able to do with computers. But it took another 120 years until people started to build electronic computers, anything like what we have today. Today, computers are everywhere. My fridge is a computer. My TV is a computer. My car is a computer. In fact, even my car keys are a computer. The phone that's in my pocket is a very, very powerful computer, much more powerful than this huge computer from the 1950s that needed a lorry to deliver it. And all of these computers can do incredibly useful things that help us in our everyday life. So I can choose any music in the world on my phone. The actual music is stored on a computer somewhere in Sweden, and it starts instantly playing out of the smart speaker in my kitchen. Oh, yeah. I can even talk to a computer and it talks back. Alexa, how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? A woodchuck would chuck about 700 pounds of wood on a good day with the wind at his back. Interesting. In many ways, all computers are very similar. They receive inputs. This could be a picture from a camera, button presses on a games controller, or sound from a microphone. The computer does something with the inputs and then produces some output, perhaps moving a character in a video game or responding with some sound. The clever bit is what the computer does to turn the inputs into useful outputs. For most of the history of computer science, the way that we've made computers do useful things is by telling them what to do. Telling a computer what to do is called programming or coding. You might have done some of this at school already, for example using Scratch or Python programming, or maybe Purple Mash. When you write a computer program, you need to decide the exact set of instructions that the computer should follow. In this case, making a mo monkey move upwards when it is clicked, playing a sound when it hits the banana, and then making it move back down again. This program was written by dragging and dropping code blocks, but could just as well have been written in a programming language. Let's think about a simple example. Even my toaster is a computer. The input is bread, the position of the timer dial, and pushing down the toaster lever. So those are all inputs. The program that controls the toaster is very simple. When the lever is pushed down, start a timer, wait until the timer equals the desired toasting time, and then pop up the toast. And the output of my toaster computer is toast. So this toaster is an example of a computer. But is it intelligent? Maybe not. Burnt my toast again. So what does it mean for a computer to be intelligent? But before we think about that, is your brain a computer? Well, some people think it is. 
If it is a computer, it's incredibly complicated, and we're not yet able to build a computer anywhere near as powerful as a human brain. Other people think that there's something about the brain that we don't understand yet and will never be able to replicate with a computer. Either way, the goal of artificial intelligence is for the computer to be able to do something that typically we require a human or human level intelligence to do. Or maybe even for the computer to be able to do something that humans find very hard or even impossible. However, there are many things that we find hard, but computers find easy. The very early computers could only do arithmetic like you do at school, adding up and multiplication. At the time, this seemed incredible. Maybe people would have even called it intelligent. But now, my phone can do it. So I can open the calculator and do 4,568 times 982 and immediately get the answer 4,485,776. But we wouldn't really call that intelligent. It's just very fast processing of very simple steps. There are also things that we find very easy that turn out to be very hard for a computer to do. For example, these robots just have to walk up to a door and open it. They fail spectacularly to do this. The last one doesn't even manage to walk from the car to the door. One definition of artificial intelligence was proposed by Alan Turing in 1950. Alan Turing was an early computer scientist who did many incredible things. He was a code breaker in the Second World War and helped to crack the Enigma code. He also developed many of the theories that underpin all modern computers. But he also devised a test for artificial intelligence called the Turing test. Imagine your person C in this diagram. You're sitting in front of a wall and behind the wall is one person and one computer. You can communicate with them by writing messages on pieces of paper and you receive their written responses back. Would you be able to decide which of them is the computer and which is human? If not, the computer is said to have passed the Turing test. And for some people, this would mean the computer is intelligent. If you've ever tried out the incredible chat GPT, then you might think computers can already pass the Turing test. But let me show you some examples of it giving answers that would make you immediately suspicious. First, I asked it how many times the letter S appears in the word sausages. A young primary age child could easily answer this, but it gives the wrong answer of two. Next, I ask it a question where it needs to understand the physical world. I asked it, what would happen if I push a football with a piece of cooked spaghetti? Its first suggestion is that the spaghetti would break or snap. We all know from a young age that cooked spaghetti is floppy and doesn't snap. But ChatGPT doesn't have our experiences to understand this. So how does AI actually work? There are two main approaches to AI. The first one was popular from the 1950s to the 1990s and is called symbolic AI. The idea is to represent the problem you are trying to solve and then to get a human to design rules that can be used to make good decisions or search for the best possible next thing to do. For some types of problem, this works well. In the 1990s, the world champion chess player Garry Kasparov was beaten by a computer called Deep Blue using this approach. At the time, people were amazed. They really thought we had an intelligent computer. Let's see how this symbolic approach to AI works using a much simpler game than chess. Imagine I'm playing a game of noughts and crosses with my daughter. She makes a move and I need to decide what to do. Hmm. We can see that I have five squares that I could possibly put my cross in. I can search through all the different ways the game can go. I want to win, but I also know that she wants to win and she will try to play the move that helps her to win. Let's consider two of the five options. If I play here, she can play the corner, giving her two different ways to win. I can only block one of them, so she takes the other and wins. I lose, so this is a bad outcome for me. This means that the original move I made would be scored badly. Let's try another option. 
If I go in the centre, I open up two ways for me to win. She can only block one of them, so I take the other and win. I score this highly, which means I score the move that led to this highly. So this is the move I will play. She blocks. And I win. Hooray! And look at her disappointment as she realises the power of symbolic AI. This way of considering all possible futures in the game is called a game tree. It's quite easy for a computer to search through a very large game tree automatically, without a human having to decide which option is best like I just did. This is how Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue. This is a kind of AI, but actually it's very similar to the coding in Purple Mash that we saw earlier. A human still needs to write the code to decide whether a move is good and to search through the game tree. This works well for simple games where the number of possible moves is small and it's easy to know if a move is good. With a powerful computer we can make a very good chess player like this. But should we even consider playing chess intelligent? I'm not so sure. This brings us to the second approach to AI, which turns out to be much more powerful and can solve many more problems. This is called machine learning. Let's start by thinking about how you are able to read. You spent hundreds of hours at school where a teacher would show you something like this. You might have said, at, and your teacher said, no, that makes a sound at. Many times you were reading, you might have sounded out k, at, cat, and someone corrected you. No, it's k, at, cat. Eventually, when you had been corrected enough times, you learned the sound and could read it. Machine learning is very similar. The computer tries to create the right output and we tell it how well it is doing, just like the teacher. We never tell it how to solve the problem, we don't write the code. Instead, it writes the code itself to learn how to solve a problem. But the code it writes is very different to the sort of code you might write. Let's see with an example. Imagine you want a machine to learn how to estimate someone's age from their photo. So the input to the machine is the photo and the output is the age. This would be an incredibly difficult program to write. I wouldn't even know where to start. In machine learning, we replace the program with some maths. The way that the maths turns input into output depends on how we set some adjustable sliders. We call these weights. If I change the weights, I get a different program. Now we need the system to learn. For this, we need training data comprising photos of people along with their actual age. We put my photo into the system and out comes a predicted age. 103 years old? That's not very nice. But we know that my actual age is 41. This is called a label. When we have labels, we can do something called supervised learning. We measure the error between the current output of our machine and what we want it to output. Now we can adjust those sliders to try to make the error go down. After one round of adjustment, our machine now predicts 37. Thanks, that's much better. That's much closer to the right output, so we know that the system is performing better. We keep adjusting until we can't make the error go down anymore, and then we've got the system as well trained as is possible. The last thing we need to know is what this program or piece of maths inside the machine actually looks like. This is copied from the human brain, or at least very loosely inspired by it. Inside the human brain are billions of a type of cell called a neuron. Neurons receive input from lots of other neurons. If they receive enough input, then they will fire, sending an output to another neuron. In machine learning, we replace a neuron with an artificial neuron, which is really just a very simple piece of maths. All an artificial neuron does 
is multiply each of its inputs by a different weight. These are the adjustable sliders. Then you add up all the results giving you its output. So, an artificial neuron is just primary school maths, addition and multiplication. To solve difficult problems, we need lots of neurons. We connect them together into something called a neural network. A typical neural network to solve a problem like estimating age from a photo will have millions of neurons, but the idea and how we train it stays the same. I'd like to finish up by showing you a few examples of how this exact approach can be applied to solving really interesting and difficult problems. You may be wondering how a computer could be trained to do something like ChatGPT, where it can generate very realistic text. Let's take this example where the input to our machine is part of a sentence. The cat sat on the... And the job of the machine is to predict the next word. In this case, it predicts bat. However, we can gather lots of training data. If we simply go on the internet and find all the text we can from every different web page, we get examples of lots of different valid sentences. In this case, the original sentence was the cat sat on the mat. So we can measure a loss like we did before against our label between bat and mat. And we can update our machine to try to produce sentences that are more like what was seen in the training data. We can then take the complete sentence, the cat's out on the mat, and feed this as input back into the system to generate the next word and keep going until we generate lots of text. This is essentially how systems like ChatGPT work. Lastly, let's see how a self-driving car might work. In this case, the input to the machine is a video frame from a camera looking out from a driver's view inside the car. The output of the machine is simply how the steering wheel should be positioned and whether the brake or accelerator is being pressed. The question is, where do we get the training data in order for such a system to learn to drive? The answer is actually very simple. We can simply have humans drive around in a car while a camera records the view out of the window and we record exactly where they had the steering wheel and what they were doing with the pedals. We can then train our machine to try to copy the behaviour that the human did when they were driving the car. By doing this, eventually the machine should be able to learn to drive in a safe way in any situation. That's exactly what's going on in this video. This car is driving entirely by itself, having only ever been provided with examples of how the steering wheel and brake and accelerator respond to what the driver sees out of the window. This sort of approach works reasonably well, although of course the car doesn't actually know where it's going or where you would like to get to. I was especially impressed a few years ago when one of our first year university students built a remote control car using exactly this approach. He built a track, put a camera on his remote control car, and then he drove the car around the track to provide it with the training data to learn to be able to drive around the track staying inside the lines. I really hope you've enjoyed watching this video and that it's inspired you to find out a bit more about artificial intelligence, robotics, self-driving cars, chat GPT and all these other exciting developments that are currently taking place. If you'd like to get more involved or have a potential future career in AI, my best advice would be to stay focused on the maths that you study at school. You wouldn't believe it, but the maths that you study at A-level, including things like the chain rule, are absolutely crucial to the um, underlying ideas behind some of what I've shown you today. Also, try out some programming, and if you can get involved in your STEM club activities related to anything like robotics, that will give you a great start and exposure to the sorts of problems that we're interested in solving in the future of AI.